Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another exciting episode of Pure Tricks, which is brought to you by Ilma University in collaboration with Rotary District International, powered by Numan Group of Companies. Hi, this is Fawad. And I'm Dr. Fabrizio Trofiro is an international expert in the regulation, quality assurance and recognition of transnational education. Fabrizio sits in the broad of directors of the International Network for Quality Assurance in Higher Education, in CAHI. He has ICTAS, formerly UK NERIC, quality benchmark services aimed at supporting the recognition of international qualifications and leads strategic engagement with key international and national stakeholders. Prior to joining NERIC, Fabrizio was with the UK Quality Assurance Agency ICA for over 10 years where he led on the quality assurance of UK t and &E, International Strategic Engagement, and the International Student Experience, and is a reviewer for a number of international quality assurance bodies. More recently Fabrizio supported the Office for Students in England in building their international engagement with a view to strengthening the regulation of English transnational education. Fabrizio holds a PhD in Political Theory and Cultural Studies, University of London, and MSc in Social Research Methods, University of Sussex, and an MA in Human Rights, University of Bologna, and held a postdoctoral research fellowship in International Integration Studies, Trinity College Dublin, as well as lecturing positions in the UK and Italy. Ladies and gentlemen please welcome Dr. Fabrizio Trofiero. Hi Fabrizio, welcome to the show, how are you? Hello, hi, very good to be here, very good to speak to you both. How are you Fabrizio? Hi, hi, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, can hear you. Yeah. Nice to see you, to have you on my show. Yeah, likewise, I'm really happy to, to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our chat today. Thank you. Uh, by looking at the profile video, uh, it just seems that you wear a number of uh, things in your head. Uh, you are uh, the head of quality benchmark at Actis UK. You are also serving as a member of Board of Governors and Board of Directors at Inkahi. And you are also serving uh, and supporting the international engagement of the Office for Students in England. So. Uh, Tell us a bit uh, more about these organizations and uh, their scope, their objectives, their work, and uh, their contribution uh, for the world in terms of quality. Sure, th th thank you very much, Farwad. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's true. There, there are a number of hats there involved. Now, uh, my former employer, let's say, is Actis. Actis is uh, the age is, is a global provider of solutions to support the recognition of international qualification. And uh, ACTIS has been uh, managing the UK qualification recognition function on behalf of the UK government since 1997, uh, since, since uh, when the UK government signed the Lisbon Recognition Convention. So we, we provide uh, expert advice, insights into international education systems, international qualifications, and how they relate to the UK and other systems. Uh, we also offer a number of other services aimed at, uh, uh, let's say, improving international understanding 
of qualifications and uh, international uh, also improving trust in those qualifications in particular in critical areas such as vocational education professional education transnational education um, now inquiry you'll be familiar with it somehow because uh, i'm aware you spoke with the deba there not, not, too, not too long ago and you are of course a member of inquiry but for the benefit of uh, of the audience inquiry is the only international network for quality assurance in our education so it brings together um, all uh, um, the international quality assurance community uh, so quality assurance bodies uh, across the continent but also agencies with an interest in quality assurance the idea is to is to create a community of practice an international community of practice for quality assurance sharing good uh, yeah, good practices lessons learned develop shared understanding about common uh, challenges and issues and trying to devise common solutions um, uh, developing the theory and practice of quality assurance as for the office for students this is something that uh, so the office for students is the regulator for higher education in england uh, they um, they regulate uh, uh, all english higher education and their regulation also extend to transnational education now there are fairly new um, uh, agency that's been established in 2017. In, in the first years of their operations, they focused on, uh, on English-based higher education, but the English higher education sector is possibly the most internationalized uh, in, in the world. So now they're really looking to make sure that uh, their um, transnational education students, that, that is the students studying for English degrees overseas, can benefit from the same regulatory, from the same regulatory oversight so i've been supporting them on a personal capacity in engaging with the local regulators so as to ensure that their approach to quality assuring english transnational education is effective and efficient and it is a it is a work that actually i'm concluding at the moment so i'm, I'm nearly ready to take the hat off i hope so, that helps uh, yeah so uh, it seems that you uh, have a lot of things in your basket. You are uh, serving for different organizations. So uh, how do you manage all this? Uh, how do you manage the pressures? How do you manage the activities? Uh, because uh, serving for one uh, leading top professional organization is quite difficult. And here in your uh, scenario, you are serving not one, not two, but three uh, big companies of the world. So how yeah. does Fabrizio manage all this? Uh, yeah, this is a, it's a good question. Uh, flexibility, uh, flexibility. Uh, unfortunately, long hours. Uh, it it, uh, it bounds to be, uh, but also flexibility by part of, for example, Actis. Uh, they've been uh, great in supporting my involvement with different uh, uh, international and national bodies. And um, yes, uh, and to be to be honest, I should say that working from home helps uh, uh, because you can squeeze in uh, more work at different times. It's not healthy for a life work balance, but it does help to, um, uh, to change hats very quickly. So, like, working from home, how much time for you? Are you taking the break in between when you were working the continuous part, uh, being at home, working at home? Sorry, sorry, I, I missed that. Let me repeat, I, how did you manage uh, uh, during this? being at home during the COVID, did you took the breaks in between or you work for the continuous part? Because we've been taking a nap in between, we were having like a lot more breaks, so how was your routine? Yeah, well, I guess it depends on the, on the days and the, and the tasks. Uh, sometimes I can really get engrossed and, and I carry on. And uh, other times I take several breaks uh, uh, in between. Um, but uh, uh, I must say that I'm, uh, I quite enjoy um, uh, working from home. Uh, it's quite nice to, to have as a colleague my wife working next door. And um, so that, that's quite pleasant. Um, and, uh, but I do, uh, I do tend to, to go to the office now and then because it's good to, to have that uh, moment of catching up with colleagues and discussing things by the side. But actually, uh, nowadays, uh, things are more difficult because uh, you uh, need not only to work uh, from home, you also need to go to office and you need to uh, give few hours to the office. And then you have to travel as well. Because now traveling has been started and people have started 
uh, moving uh, from one country to uh, other for workshops, conferences, meetings. So now I think the pressures are uh, more sophisticated. Uh, if you, we you're right. To that time, uh, while we were working for the home. Yeah, you're right. But I think there is, there is a, um, uh, an increasing awareness that uh, many of the things that in the past we thought we had to do uh, in person can, do, uh, can be done in different ways. I used to travel, because I'm based in Gloucester, which is two hours from London. I used to travel to London sometimes two or three times a week and uh, uh, sometimes for two hours meetings or uh, you know, not for the whole day. Most of those things can be done now uh, from, uh, from home, uh, in particular engaging internationally as well. Uh, I think there's going to be uh, international organization will need to be more strategic about uh, when um, uh, meeting in person. Uh, so, and so, even universities, we, we can see that uh, um, uh, probably a topic we'll talk about. Uh, universities with a lot of international activity, with transnational education, have started to learn to manage those international operations by uh, through different means, through online um, facilities. Yeah, that means we have to manage uh, in either way, being at home or being or uh, coming physically. We have to manage because we have to continue. I guess we are we have to, yeah, we, we need to find a way, yeah. Yeah. So, right. Kavizu, as you talked about uh, transnational education or TNE and its quality assurance, could you tell us more about TNE and what is it, why it is important, and why its quality assurance is important? And some of the key challenges are involved in it. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Now, um, transnational education can be considered as uh, education provision offered overseas. So we're talking about the mobility of education programs rather than the mobility of students. It is really about uh, uh, taking education to students who, for whatever reason, uh, they're unable or unwilling to travel internationally, but they would like to take an international uh, education. Uh, and this can take place in different ways, the different modes of uh, TNE delivery uh, from uh, branch campuses uh, to different types of collaborative partnerships, joint double degrees, twinning arrangements, validation franchises, uh, as well as uh, increasingly now online and hybrid forms of learning in a combination of all these. So the, the, the landscape is getting very, very complicated. Uh, as well as growing, there are num an increasing number of institutions involved in transnational education. There is an increasing number of students studying on transnational education programs. An increasing number of countries, other as, as sending or receiving countries, now being involved in transnational education. Um, and um, so you can see, even from the definition of transnational education, that TNE has, a, has an, uh, an inherent progressive potential to widen access to international education. Um, and then this, I think, uh, uh, I think the international education community has been able to appreciate that over the past two years in particular. In particular. Of course, uh, all institutions had to manage a transition to online learning, but many institutions with transnational education outposts have been able to use those to offer some, so, some form of um, physical uh, learning environment to international students stranded overseas and some institutions have actually started developing international partnerships uh, to provide that physical experience to students that are unable to move so there, it has an incredible potential but of course going to to the challenges um, in order for that progressive potential to be untapped we need to make sure that the transnational education is of, is of good quality we don't want to widen access to poor education um, so, so the, in fact, the main one of the main challenges around transnational education, really, and around the, one of the main challenges for the growth of quality TNE is related to quality assurance, mm, uh, making sure that uh, uh, the standards and quality of education programs offered overseas are comparable to those offered back uh, back home. This is a this is a main challenge, and this ultimately re relates to recognition because if uh, 
international stakeholders, credential evaluators cannot place confidence on the quality of a transnational education qualifications, then they will recognize it. And that will uh, hinder its growth. It will also hinder the mobility and the portability uh, of, of those qualifications. And uh, uh, in particular, in a context uh, where uh, there is, unfortunately, there is not a shared quality assurance framework for transnational education. Uh, not all countries have systems in place to quality assure transnational education. Those that do have systems in place, sometimes, uh, uh, usually they differ from each other. Um, and sometimes they're not very comprehensive or as robust as those that they use for quality assuring national provision. So there are still quality assurance challenges. Uh, so this, this is really uh, uh, the area I'm working on. And, and, and this is one of the main reasons why I'm very interested in trying to make a contribution there as a way to untap, uh, as I was saying, the progressive pot potential of transnational education as a quality way to widen access to education. Uh, and this is really the work that uh, we are doing now at ECTIS. Uh, we, we developed this, uh, this service called the TNE Quality Benchmark Service, which is a way of um, uh, giving a tool to transnational education providers to be able to demonstrate to international stakeholders that, that their TNE operations meet international best practice so as to improve uh, the recognition of, of their TNE operations. Just to give so you a bit the, of an overview, yeah. All right. So, are there like other international uh, quality assurance agencies are on board with you uh, uh, when you are, you know, transnationalization? Uh, you are under this process. So, as like the, the UK is the country and UK is linking up with the Pakistani universities, right? So, United Kingdom or as Actis or in Bahi, these agencies are on board with you. How about? The agencies from Pakistan or other countries where you are going to, you know, globalize this higher education. So are these, Absolutely. you know, agencies on board with yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can see the, um, uh, where you're coming from. If I understand your question, absolutely. I think absolutely crucial to strengthen the effectiveness and efficiency of quality assurance in transnational education is cross-border cooperation in, between quality assurance bodies. So it is quality assurance bodies of the sending countries, such as the OFS or the quality assurance agency for, uh, for other uh, nations of the UK uh, or TEXA in Australia, cooperating with uh, uh, quality assurance bodies in, uh, in, uh, in receiving countries, such as HEC in Pakistan or MQA in Malaysia. And this is in fact, this is in fact uh, uh, a big part of my previous work or my past work, trying to lead in uh, enhancing uh, cross-border cooperation in quality assurance so as to uh, address the quality assurance gaps but also unnecessary quality assurance overlaps uh, which may hinder the development of TNE because they, if quality assurance overlaps often translate in regulatory burden on transnational education providers who have to undergo uh, double oversight. So you really yeah. need uh, coordination between the quality assurance bodies. And this is, of course, something that Hinkai uh, does very well, trying to bring together quality assurance bodies to, to share understandings, uh, perspectives, try to enhance cooperation. Uh, with the, with the, our scheme at ECTIS, uh, which is a voluntary scheme, uh, uh, we do hope that uh, we could provide a platform which could catalyze cooperation between quality assurance bodies in sending and receiving countries, but also beyond quality assurance bodies, also qualification recognition entities, credential evaluators, they also play an important role. And it is important that the quality assurance and the qualification recognition community work more closely together. Uh, uh, for easy understanding of our viewers, uh, let me give you two scenarios so that we can understand better what is transnational education. Sure. Now, scenario number one is that a student is sitting in Pakistan and he or she is uh, pursuing a master's program from UK International University. And he or she, the student, is studying all the course through online. Now, does it come under transnational education? Because there is no infrastructure here of the parent university, only the student who is residing in Pakistan is uh, doing his or her master's program online through UK University. 
scenario number one. Yeah. So scenario number one is online delivery. Um, online delivery can be regarded as a, uh, as a form of transnational education. Uh, if, uh, if a student in Pakistan study for a UK or an Australian degree, stay in Pakistan, this is often considered transnational education. Even if sometimes uh, it is uh, questionable so, uh, in, in, because uh, that students could be anywhere in the world, including in the home country. Uh, so, but, but technically, because a student is, is placed somewhere else, then uh, where the degree awarding body is based, that can be regarded as national education. Aware, for example, issues around quality assurance, program development, program delivery. While the technology, where there are so many advantages of the technology, yeah. uh, it also teaches us to have patience because we can get yeah. disconnected anytime. So sorry yeah, for that. That's that's, that's right. Flexibility and resilience is, uh, is absolutely key when it comes to, to technology and international engagement. Absolutely. Yeah, not a problem at all. Yeah. So uh, uh, we were at scenario number one and uh, uh, we were discussing about if a student is sitting in Pakistan and pursuing his or her uh, master's program from UK university to online. So this comes under internationalization and transnational education, right? That, that would fall, yeah, definitely it is a form of internationalization of borderless education and can be considered also more technically uh, a form of transnational education. Even if, if I was saying that students could be anywhere in the world, including in the UK. Okay. Now, the scenario number two is that I've seen many students because a uh, lot of international universities uh, have uh, their uh, offshore campuses, uh, like uh, a university in UK is having a campus here in Pakistan and through the local partners. Local partners have established the infrastructure and uh, uh, they have obtained uh, affiliation from UK International University. So uh, a student is studying in Pakistan uh, in a local campus uh, who is having affiliation with UK International University. So this also comes under uh, t uh, Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so the, the rule of thumb is that whenever there is a, a, an, a credit or a, um, an award which is uh, um, uh, offered or delivered outside of uh, the place where the degree awarding body is based, that is transnational education. So in that case, we are talking about uh, transnational education because uh, students are studying for a UK or an Australian degree in Pakistan. Somehow the modality doesn't matter. In this case, it is through some form of partnership with a local uh, other service provider or a local uh, delivery institution, but it is part of transnational education, yes. But, but the curriculum would be of the parent institute, right? Uh, the, the curriculum could be from either. So, for example, if, if the curriculum is from the degree awarding body, from the TNE provider, then we're calling, we are talking about franchise, a franchise oh. arrangement. But the curriculum could be from the Pakistani partner. And, and, and it is validated by the UK degree awarding body. And then we're talking about a validation arrangement um, where, where usually the foreign, the validating degree awarding body provides, provides quality assurance uh, of the program. And it, it is not that involved in development of the program or delivery. It means, it means uh, that cross-national education phenomena uh, is partially old and partially new because uh, I've seen that a lot of un international universities are having uh, affiliated campuses in other countries and this is a quite old pop phenomenon. But the change that we see is that after COVID-19, stress has been uh, given on online education technology. through uh, technology and international partners. So it means that uh, transnational education post COVID-19 is relatively a new phenomena and uh, we need to work out a lot on maintaining and assuring its quality. Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree that there are elements of uh, um, which are newer th 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 than others and I'm all, I also agree that COVID-19 has had an impact on, uh, on the t &E landscape. Uh, online learning also is quite, uh, is quite established um one of the main challenges uh, to its expansion internationally uh, have been uh, i think 
probably related to two to do to two factors. One is access, uh, because when we're talking about uh, uh, online learning, you need to make sure that people have the the, the right uh, um, uh, IT uh, tools uh, at disposal. But also recognition, because not many countries recognize foreign online learning. There are countries that recognize only national online learning. Uh, and this has to do with what I was saying earlier on, an issue of trust. But during the COVID pandemic, everyone had to offer programs online. So they, I think the international education community has started to get a better understanding what it takes to deliver quality online learning. For example, it's not only a matter of uh, digitalizing content, you need to think about engaging students. Um, uh, but And also quality assurance bodies, in particular credential evaluators, have relaxed the recognition practices, although there's still quite a lot of mistrust around online learning. Now, um, what uh, uh, what has changed, I think, with uh, uh, with COVID is that uh, uh, transnational education arrangements are more flexible. We, we, we see that uh, um, internationalized providers are, are exploring innovative forms of, uh, of cooperation. And I see that uh, there could be an indication that in the future, the distinction between an international student and a transnational education student will be increasingly blurred because students may start their studies of a UK degree, say in Pakistan, and then move and continue it in a branch campus of, an, of, of the same institution or another institution, say in Dubai, and then move to the UK. Um, so that there's going to be more flexibility in ways in which students will be able to pursue their international education. But in order to, for that to be so, you need to have the infrastructure, the regulatory infrastructure in place in terms of quality assurance and recognition. And this is the responsibility that quality assurance bodies, credential evaluators have to work together to develop shared frameworks to facilitate the internationalization, the growth of quality internationalization and quality mobility. I think those are students would be called as local students. The combination of global and local universities. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I think you, you can uh, you can call them that way. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, another another dynamic which is taking place is um, comes under the the term the uh, the acronym COIL, Collaborative Online International Learning, which is a very good way to internationalize the experience of students unable to go abroad through uh, online collaboration with other universities. So the, uh, clearly the, there are new, uh, new aspects and new frontiers for internationalization. Our viewers must be having one question in their mind and allow me to ask this question on their behalf. Is that you chose internationalization and transnational education as your field. And uh, you are working uh, deeply uh, for this field. Uh, so, what made you enter into this field? I mean, who motivated you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, was it by a choice? Yeah. Was yeah. it by uh, an opportunity, or was it by a force? Yeah. Well, I, I think everything is life, uh, uh, and a combination of choice and uh, and and fate and opportunity. Let's say that. Uh, um, I've been involved in, uh, and I've been leaving, let's say, internationalization, international education uh, from an early age because I, I came to the UK to study as an undergraduate student through a, a study abroad program, the European Erasmus program. And, and that's, that was also because I was studying a subject which uh, uh, related to, uh, to British culture. I was studying uh, analytical philosophy, which is uh, pre predominantly uh, American and, and British philosophy. I came here, I appreciated the way the, the UK approach to, uh, to teaching and learning. I decided to stay here for my postgraduate studies. Then I went to, to, uh, to Dublin for my postdoctoral studies. So I, I lived in breath international education. Um, but, uh, uh, but there is a connection. When I, when I embraced when i decided to cross the fence and at the time joining the quality assurance agency in the uk uh, and, and started to work for quality assurance of higher education there was a link between what i was doing earlier and quality assurance because my research interests my academic studies focused on globalization and how 
to democratize globalization, how to translate at a global level the democratic principles that uh, uh, those people who are affected by decisions should ever say in those, deci in the, those decisions. Um, so how to hold accountable um, global operators such as uh, multinational uh, corporations, such as intergovernmental organizations, UNESCO, for example, or uh, non-governmental organizations such as Oxfam or Amnesty International. How, do, how does the world take, uh, um, make them accountable? So when I joined the, uh, the Quality Assurance Agency to Quality Assurance, <coughs> excuse me, to Quality Assurance Transnational Education, for me, there was a direct link because it was about holding global education providers to account, making sure that they remain accountable to, to the students, to the key stakeholders they serve across borders, that is international students and, uh, and international uh, quality assurance bodies or credential evaluators. So there was that, that link. Really appreciate that. All right, Fabrizio. As uh, like CNE is a uh, one specific uh, dimension of internationalization. What are you know further dimensions for interna internationalization and how they are developed historically? Yeah, well, uh, um, uh, there are a number of dimensions which are of course uh, uh, all intertwined and increasingly so. Uh, I would say, um, of course. Research has been internationalized for a long time, and uh, and COVID uh, has also shown the benefits of international cooperation in research. So it's about uh, a matter of facilitating advancement. Um, but if you look at uh, uh, internationalization of teaching and learning, in particular, then I think at the beginning, internationalization was primarily about international student mobility about uh, a study abroad and recruiting international students uh, and in certain countries increasingly as a way to offset cap funding for national higher education so that that the institution could could recruit international students who could be charged probably higher fees uh, and all that um, and then there's been a phase of uh, uh, I, I think it is fair to say of uh, um, institutions developing all the uh, the services around servicing this uh, uh, this type of internationalization student service student services had to be internationalized um, in English language support for English uh, lang language providers or career advice or and and other things related to that such as for example international student recruitment. Uh, international offices within institutions started to get bigger and, and focusing on international student recruitment, working with agents. Uh, agents start to uh, um, to develop everywhere in the world. So all the, the industry, related industries start growing. And then, of course, uh, uh, internationalization at home also included aspects such as uh, internationalizing the curriculum uh, as a way also to meet the needs of international students coming to you and study but also as a way to internationalize, internationalize the experience of the students, those national students were unable to go overseas and, uh, uh, and train and educate all students as global citizens. So there's been these, these dimensions. Transnational education is another dimension. It started to develop a bit later. It was about bringing education to those students who couldn't come to your campus. Uh, uh, and transnational education is growing, and uh, I believe it will be growing in different forms, as I was saying uh, earlier on. And that and that poses a number of challenges, and then also the development of different solutions as well. Uh, some of the challenges are, for example, uh, not that of internationalizing the curriculum, but localizing it. So if I if I bring my course to Pakistan or to Malaysia or, or to Hong Kong. How do I make sure that they are fit for purpose and they're relevant to the context? Um, a classical example is uh, um, universities, uh, for example, in the UK, offering courses in, uh, um, in engineering uh, in Malaysia. Uh, in Malaysia, they need to, uh, to be expert in cooling down environments, not in heating up environments. So how, how, the, how the curriculum adapts to, to the local content. Um, and uh, and then there are uh, an additional dimension uh, to conclude, really, which is uh, uh, which I already talked about, which is the regulatory infrastructure 
So as institutions have started to internationalize, quality assurance bodies, uh, uh, governments, credential evaluators had to, pl had to play catch up uh, in order to make sure that uh, quality wasn't uh, um, uh, jeopardized, but also to facilitate the mobility of, uh, of students and programs. So you need to have uh, measures in place so that international stakeholders, employers can trust those qualifications obtained through internationalization. So there are a number of dimensions there really, which have developed and now increasingly are all intertwined. Well, I think I must add there is a, also one dimension uh, I, I read somewhere, like there was also the immigration issues for the students. Whoever wanted to come to the you know, international universities, they were, they were always having this problem, like due to the visa, they you know lost their three to four years by waiting for their visa, right? So I can absolutely one of the problem. So uh, absolutely, the yeah. Education, international education, do, uh, don't happen in um, in isolation or in, in a void, but they are embedded with uh, other aspects of uh, social and political life, including issues of migration and, and visa. You can see in the UK, I remember two thousand and twelve. The, the student visa routes changed significantly. In particular, the post-study the post work visa uh, was, was cancelled and you, you saw a massive drop of students, in particular from India, who were interested to, um, uh, to come to the UK to, to get a, a work experience after, after graduation. The same had happened in Australia a few years earlier. Then Australia learned the lesson and opened up the post study work visa again. The UK now has opened it up again. There are a number of issues that uh, interplay with each other. And see, uh, uh, what I understand is that uh, internationalization, specifically TNE, uh, they are just like uh, nucleus, and around this nucleus, uh, electrons are evolving. Like, if an institution wants to get uh, international ranking, uh, internationalization, partnerships, these are important. See, uh, when uh, we talk about uh, international ranking, uh, organizations uh, speak about uh, different culture students. So uh, this also adds to that core area. Uh, when we talk about sustainable development goals, this internationalization serves for different SDGs like quality education, like partnerships, uh, eliminating poverty. So see, this single concept of phenomena is contributing to a lot of other factors that are significant for getting uh, higher education institutions at par. Uh, yeah, absolutely right. Uh, and, uh, and it goes uh, two ways in the sense that uh, uh, internationalization contributes to advance uh, um, 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 progress and development uh, uh, across the whole society, but also it is responsive to, to changes in priorities. For example, with regard to transnational education, for example, at the beginning, the main rationale was primarily commercial. But now, um, uh, TNE providers are changing uh, um, the rationale for engaging TNE, also because there's been an increasing request for transnational education, for example, to deliver in terms of uh, employability and employment after graduation. So making sure that your programs are relevant. Uh, making sure that you contribute to sustainable development, to the development of the local context. Increasingly, there is a, a clear request by part of host countries that transnational education providers contribute also to the capacity development of local institutions, local partners, and the transfer of knowledge. So, um, uh, it, it, as, as, as I was saying, international education doesn't happen in the void, it's really embedded in uh, the rest all the rest of uh, uh, all the other spheres of society and uh, in response to them it contributes to them right so Fabrizio like uh, what what the initiatives and policies are developed to enhance the internationalization of territory education um yes yeah, that's, that's a big question um yeah i think it can be intended in uh, can be intended in two ways um, there are initiatives aimed at uh, um, uh, improving internationalization in the sense of growing, uh, supporting its growth. 
And uh, you can see, uh, in fact, uh, uh, another dimension of internationalization and, and the demonstration that is increasingly important is that uh, an increasing number of governments uh, worldwide are developing uh, international education strategy, national international education strategies, and uh, uh, which are supportive of the internationalization of the national education sector. So that there are really sector-wide initiatives aimed at supporting the efforts of uh, national institutions, uh, both in terms of international research, international student mobilities, but also increasingly transnational education. So there are an, a number of uh, macro initiatives which are uh, which are taking place. If you look at Europe, these macro initiatives are, are even at the regional level. The European Union played played an important tool in the internationalization of. Uh, uh, of Europe, of European countries, or regionalization of European countries, but also regionalization of uh, European uh, uh, higher education. Um, and this is uh, in, in a number of ways, uh, increasing, for example, if you look at the, the recent uh, uh, UK and Australian international education strategies, there are clear connection between uh, international education, international trade. So there, there are this, this, uh, this uh, um, uh, instruments aimed at growing uh, international education. Institutions themselves are, are working hard to, to develop the international footprint. Uh, um, I, I mentioned earlier on uh, the growth of uh, 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 recruitment agents. So you can see at the moment a big development in the recruitment agents landscape where, where recruitment agents uh, have met uh, IT and big data with the advent of aggregators putting together uh, um, uh, local agents and, and uh, at a mass scale, at a, at a mass scale, connecting international students and international providers. So you see uh, a number of initiatives uh, developing to, to support the growth of internationalization, growth of foundation programs or pathway programs as well, which connects to transnational education. Um, and uh, then there are instruments aimed at enhancing the quality of international education. And this can, can be intended in different ways. For example, we see uh, a number of uh, institutions and countries trying to develop guidance and tools to support and enhance the quality of international students coming in. Australia and New Zealand are, are, have done uh, a great job here. They even uh, embedded uh, uh, a quality international student experience in regulation. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier on the internationalization of student service. These are really, uh, some of these are very new initiatives that institutions still need to do quite a lot, for example, to internationalize career advice. So I'm a student from, uh, uh, from Pakistan and I'm going to study uh, in UK for a UK degree, but then I want to go back to Pakistan and work. How do I connect with the industry back in Pakistan? So, and, and a lot of institutions are investing now in internationalization of career advice, for example. So th there's a, there are a number of initiatives that are taking place. Um, uh, COVID has, has opened up an opportunity to, um, uh, to carry out uh, virtual internship, which I think is very interesting, um, and, uh, which, uh, which really opens up uh, the, the opportunity for international students to take international uh, internships. Um, and then there are talking about quality again. All the all the developments I mentioned around the quality issues of transnational education. There are still important gaps, but there are also an increased awareness of the importance of quality issues in transnational education. Countries now looking at how they can strengthen and develop uh, the the oversight of transnational education. How they can talk to each other to make sure that they uh, they coordinate actions. So there are a number of initiatives that INCA is playing its role there as well. Because uh, I think Fabrizio earlier there were like different agents, right? International agents who were supporting or consulting the students of, uh, you know, the uh, national country. But there were also a lot of problems like uh, getting uh, admission in the university and being there and studying. There was a huge gap. Whatever the agents were doing, they were just connecting you to the university, but they used to leave you in between, rather, you know, completing this this gap. So I think this transnationalization or uh, this internationalization has helped out, uh, you know, skipping these agents too. 
and i think there are also registered agents out there who are helping out who are connecting to the both of the universities right so how about that are are these uh, agents are still there in this process or not yeah absolutely they're still there and um, what what you see if i if i get also your question uh, right uh, you see um uh the development of uh, um of innovative services by part of agents agents trying to uh, guide international students through the through the student uh, through their recruitment journey uh, um, helping them with uh, with student visas with uh, uh, in, uh, integration to local culture uh, sometimes with the preliminary induction uh um so th- there there are a, a, a number of additional services that agents are are playing um now uh with the, the growth of uh, the importance of the role that agents play and their increased use also the issues of accountability of agents has uh, has become very important uh for example an issue which uh, which is uh, um, uh, often mentioned is that agents are paid by both by the institution and by students <laughs> excuse me by students it could be a conflict of interest but if they are commissioned by the institution are they able to provide an honest and transparent advice to students so there are a number of issues there and uh, as i was saying australia and new zealand are quite uh, ahead and did quite a lot of work in terms of uh, student protection and in fact uh, uh, the regulation of student agents in australia is regulated um because it's that in order to um, uh, to make sure that these issues are not allowed in the united states you have a situation where us institutions cannot pay commission to agents for the recruitment yeah. of us students but they can pay commission to agents for the recruitment of international students although things are are, are, are moving so um, yeah uh, uh, with increased importance of uh, uh, recruitment agents uh, demands for accountability Uh, are increasing again yeah see the show is getting more interesting uh, fabrizio i have a food for thought see uh, we have now been enjoying transnational education across the world now we need to do th- two things one we need to ensure that transnational education improves get improves day by day and it needs to be provided on a continuous basis and sorry oh now and it needs to be provided to the students on continuous basis the, the, uh, there can be no gap in between the provision of transnational education now i see two challenges here the first challenge is that for having a continuous supply of transnational education we need to have strong international relations uh if, if we if we can uh, if we can look at uh, the uh, different wars worldwide the current war in the in ukraine if you if you wish uh, or even the, uh, the of course the covid crisis they have uh, they have uh, um, play significant challenges to um, um, to the continuous success of international education but we challenges are opportunities are opportunities to take different shapes uh and forms and to and to change uh to um uh, to continue to exist and, and this is what uh, education providers uh, have done over the past two years to revise the internationalization strategies to try to offer provision to international students in different way of course online learning is uh, uh, was a prominent way but also in person tra- transnational education quality assurance i completely agree the, the, the main challenge for for the quality assurance of transnational education in all its forms including online learning is to as i was saying earlier on is to make sure that you are able to instill confidence in international stakeholders that the quality standards of that provision is uh, comparable to provision which is quality assure uh, at national level in more traditional uh, uh, way uh, quality assuring at a distance poses a number of challenges uh in particular in terms of resources uh having to travel internationally uh but um but there, there is emerging uh, good practice in carrying out uh online uh, uh, quality assurance reviews uh, i've carried out uh, a number of them uh, um, successfully already and they can work 
uh, they can work well. Um, so you need to make sure that you put uh, establish very clear protocol on how, on how you do that. Um, there is also uh, innovation in quality assurance in relation to a move to uh, a move away from uh, institutional review as we know it to a more best based outcome based metrics driven quality assurance that will allow quality assurance uh, um, bodies regulators to monitor how higher education institutions are doing in different ways without requiring necessarily an in-person engagement. Uh, uh, Australia and England, to so Tex and the Office for Students, and the Office for Students are leading on this, uh, and, and it could be a development that is going to picked up by other countries. Uh, I'm thinking about large countries such as Pakistan or China or India, which uh, uh, even nationally struggle in implementing physical forms of uh, institutional reviews, and they're considering using metrics, big data, a bit more um, strategically. Okay. Uh, as, as the topic is going, like the discussion is going really interesting, we wanted to, you know, give it hours, hours to speak about it. But due to the short of time, I need to switch to my rapid fire round. So, Fabrizio, are you ready for that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I don't know what to, what to expect. <laughs> All, right. All right. The very first question is. What is the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? Oh dear. Um, well, I think uh, possibly, and I'm afraid to say that, is, uh, um, is checking the phone. Although right. the first thing I do when I get up then is, uh, is brewing a coffee. Oh, perfect. But normally, we do what we do, we just look for a phone around. Yeah, yeah. It yeah okay. I, I'm ashamed about that. Yeah. So, how many hours of sleep do you take? Yeah, well, uh, uh, I wish I could take a bit more. Uh, I think possibly, uh, uh, I would say that six on average uh, okay. is possibly good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, which book are you reading these days, Fabrizio? Okay. Um, as, uh, as many of us, I think, uh, I've got a couple on the go. Um, I'm reading, uh, uh, which I should go back to it, this uh, uh, book from uh, um, a French um, uh, sociologist, uh, Bruno Latour, which is about uh, the post-COVID uh, uh, world, I think it's after, after COVID. Um, and uh, it, is, uh, it has an interesting take on, uh, um, on how we can learn from COVID how to live in a uh, uh, environmentally uh, threatened world uh, going forward. And then I'm also, uh, next to my bed, I've got the Stanley Tucci recipe book. Stanley Tucci, the American uh, actor, yeah. Uh, he's, uh, you know, with, Italian, with Italian recipes, yeah. But, but see, reading is now covered uh, by, because you are a researcher as well. So it's not necessary that you read books because we researchers uh, used to read a lot of literature in order to uh, make new tests and make new discoveries. So I think uh, now reading books have been replaced by leading, uh, reading literature uh, as far as uh, we researchers are concerned. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm not considering all the policy documents that <laughs> I'm going through every day. I'm just talking about physical books. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what has been your favorite age so far? Oh, that's, that's a difficult one. Um, yeah, I, I did enjoy my, my youth uh, when I could play football freely. Uh, I, I liked those days, oh. yeah. Around uh, 14, 15, 16, that, that was good. Okay. Uh, in which subject you were worst at school? <laughs> the, the, the subject I was worst at school, uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I was really bad at Latin. I didn't like Latin at all for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The most influential person in your life? The most influential person? Well, I think, yeah, as every of us, I think we'll have many people uh, who has influenced us in different, st different stages of our life. Um, well, I think in, in terms of 
how to live in this world. Uh, uh, possibly my uncle, uh, my, my dad's brother, has had an uh, important influence in the ways he was always available to people, um, kind, but also being able to take himself lightly. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's right. Then there are, there are, there have been people who have influenced me uh, intellectually in terms of their philosophy. But yeah, as well. Wonderful. So, if you got a do-over in your life, what would that be? If I want to redo something, yes, okay. to do it to, to, to do it again, do it again because I did it wrong or because I liked it. Sorry. Do it again because it, because I did it wrong or because I liked it and I want to do it again. In like both it. of the ways. In both of the ways. All right. Uh, I, I don't know, really. Um, there are a lot of things that probably I could do differently. Uh, absolutely, plenty of them. Um, well, uh, there are a number of episodes, but yeah, I, I, I wouldn't know how to answer that one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go ahead. What is your biggest expense? The biggest fear? Strength. 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 Uh, the biggest strength. Oh. Uh, biggest strength. Um, biggest strength. Uh, I guess. Well, I guess possibly. Uh, although I, I do like winning. I don't mind losing. Uh, so I, I haven't got any problem with losing. So I guess resilience, possibly. I don't know. Hmm. So what is one side that people don't know about Fabio? The one side. <laughs> tricky question. By the way, uh, I, I don't know. I guess different people don't, don't know uh, different sides of me. Um, yeah, uh, I do like uh, I do like plants. I like succulent uh, plants. It's just a little hobby of mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tend to keep it private. Hidden... Yeah. <laughs> oh, perfect. And what is your hidden talent? The biggest hidden... challenge. Hidden mm. talent. I have a hidden you, talent. I, I have heard you sing very well. So this may be your talent. Uh, a, a hidden talent? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think other people have to say that. I like cooking. Uh, whether, oh, whether cooking well, sometimes my daughter doesn't agree with, the, with that. So I don't know whether it is a talent. But yeah. Okay. okay. So by cooking, a man gets an extra star from uh, his family. Is, is, is that right? <laughs> Okay. Uh, would you ever appear on a reality show if you got the chance? Well, I think uh, uh, I think not. I think uh, th this type of interviews like that is uh, it, it's the maximum probably I, I would do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Fabrizio. Like, are you in the profession that you dreamed of when you were a child? Um, well, I, I think it is. Uh, I would be surprised if I hear uh, a child saying I would like to do quality assurance of international education. I would get very worried. Uh, so, so not really. Uh, as I was saying, there are elements of choice, but also of opportunities in uh, uh, in uh, in the way in which your professional career shapes up. Uh, although um, I. I'm happy with the possibility of engaging internationally, which is what I wanted to uh, to do as a child. So, and this and this uh, type of work allow me exactly to engage internationally as as, as today. Great. So, again, if you got the chance, uh, would you like to travel in the past or in the future? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, it would be fascinating because in the past, isn't it? And. Um, I'm generally more attracted about uh, traveling in the future, although I think it's quite grim. So I'm a bit scared these days uh, about the prospect of traveling in the future. Mm. Perfect. Uh, three words that define Fabrizio. Three words. Mm. That define me. Ooh, that's, that's, <laughs> a, that's, a, that's a difficult one. Um, that's a difficult one. Uh, I could say... I guess probably I'm uh, uh, generally um, available, resilient, and uh, um, good humored. Possibly, I I don't know. I'm just uh, yeah, thinking on top of my head. Uh, different people will will agree and disagree about different words. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
right. See, it's a journal phenomena. If someone asks us about uh, us to describe ourselves, see, we can speak a lot about our field of expertise. But I think That's generally right. all of us uh, hardly uh, give time to ourselves to uh, evaluate and study ourselves. So this is the uh, generally a difficult question for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. And uh, 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 if I ask you, how would you define yourself? Uh, yeah, well, I'll take uh, <laughs> three to four minutes to think what defines you. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. That's what I should have answered. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and additionally, if someone speaks about, uh, if someone asks me to define my weaknesses, then again I'll take so much time to think what are my weaknesses. Though there difficult. are a lot of weaknesses. Yeah, you don't want to give away too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that. All right, Fabrizio, what do you think is the key to living as a, as a good life? The key? Oh, um, well, um, the key to living a good life, um, it's, 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 very, uh, it's, it's a very difficult one, but uh, I think that uh, uh, my kindness to other people is absolutely essential. Um, and uh, then happiness can be achieved in different ways. One is uh, trying to satisfy all, uh, all your needs. The other one is trying to lower the needs that you have. I think so being, being uh, ready to compromise uh, and uh, relinquish some of your unsatisfied needs is also a way of uh, living a, a, an happy life. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Rizzo, were you a, a mischievous child or a decent one? Mm, well, if you ask my, uh, my parents, I think that they, they thought I was very good. Uh, but I, 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 I never told everything to my parents. So, th there are aspects that they don't know. <laughs> so, how many times have you been beaten by the parents? No, no I don't think I've never been. <laughs> yeah, never been. Yeah. Sorry for the embarrassing question, but uh, no, I no, was beaten a lot by my parents. So, <laughs> I was raised of enlightenment because I was quite mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, Kabiko, what is your deepest fear? Deepest fear, um, again, the, the, the difficult one. Uh, I guess uh, wait, I, I do fear about losing uh, uh, dear people, the people that were we are dear to me. Yeah. All right. And your favorite part uh, about working at home? Uh, yeah, I guess probably, as I was saying, just uh, having my wife as a colleague next door. That's quite nice. Can you name one friend who's your childhood friend? Maybe yes. uh, when you were four or five years old and that gentleman or uh, the lady is still there connected with you. Y yeah, yeah, I've got plenty. Uh, I think I've been very lucky here because uh, I have plenty of friends uh, who I, I knew when I was little, when I was younger, 10, 15 years old, and they are still a strong part of my life. Uh, okay, at least four or five of them really play a strong, strong role in my life. So when Fabrizio sits with those friends, do we see the same Fabrizio that is sitting right now on the show, or mm. uh, a different one? A different one. I, I think probably you will see a different one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Moving forward, what is your favorite holiday, Fabrizio? Yeah, it's, 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 I guess it's, it's a tricky one because it depends really on uh, um, what you really what you need at a particular time, a uh, particular moment in time. Uh, I do like going on the mountains, but I don't do that that often. Um, I tend to go by the sea just because my family live by the sea. Um, but I really love when, particularly uh, uh, in the summer, I'm up in the mountains, and I would like to do it a bit more often. Mm. So how do you spend your holiday when, uh, for example, the week off that you have? So how do you yeah. spend that day? Well, do do? <laughs> if I, yeah, well, the, being uh, living internationalization, say, not living outside of my uh, home country and my family being back home in Italy, I tend to spend big holidays back home just to see family, which is great. Uh, but I, I often would, wouldn't dare calling them holiday. Uh, because you got all the uh, family di uh, dynamics <laughs> and all that, um, so that that's what I, that's what I usually do. Um, so I, I like to do 
uh, other things uh, uh, as holidays as well. Um, but yeah, generally, if you, if you ask me what you do for holidays, I go back home, stay with family, and uh, yeah, relax with family. And what are your current hobbies? Because hobbies change with the passage of time. So, what are your current hobbies? Yeah, my current, as I was saying, I've got this this, uh, um, this passion about uh, succulent plants and cactuses, and, and I like exploring that. It's, it's, it's a weird thing that uh, it's starting lockdown, um, and uh, so I do that. Uh, yeah. I, I do like sport. Uh, now and then, I do play football. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, Fabrizio, my last question is, what is your favorite color to wear? Uh, I don't think I have one. Um, it, it could be white, uh, which I'm not wearing today, but uh, I, I do like white. I like how about shirt and your shirt. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I haven't got really a particular fav favorite color. Yeah. But what happens to us is that now uh, we are so busy in the professional world that we just in the morning open the wardrobe and put the hand yeah, like this, and yeah. whatever comes, we take it out. Quite, quite right. Quite right. I, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Yeah. Right. That's great. That's great. That was amazing for a rapid fire show, Fabrizio. And I'm sure a lot of people would know the things that we have asked and they do. They didn't know that before uh, listening to this show. Over to you, Fawan. Uh, Fabrizio, what is your feedback about the show? How uh, can we improve this show further? What, what strengths do you see in the show? Because mm -hmm. you have been seeing the other episodes of the show as well. Uh, in this show, basically, we are trying to bring out those people uh, who are so successful and who are serving big organizations and uh, who are uh, actually the celebrities from academia and industry. So we uh, target such people. And see, uh, because we, uh, the audience is tired of uh, watching and seeing the presentation. So what we did in this show is that we eliminated the presentation part. And now we are discussing. Uh, it seems that we are sitting together and we are discussing on different issues. So it uh, and, uh, blended with uh, fun questions as well. So this is the format of the show. So what yeah, is yeah. your feedback? Yeah? This is one, one, one dimension of transnational education, I must say. Yeah, yeah. Well, but I, I think actually this is the strength of uh, uh, of what you're doing. Um, exactly. Also, not over preparing it, making it as natural as possible. Yes. Uh, um, even the questions that we're asking, you know, we not prepare in advance. Um, so, um, and uh, as you say, focusing on uh, topical issues. But in a more conversational way, without it from a presentation, uh, there's a, a lot of webinar fatigue. Uh, and then, of course, these uh, this, uh, last uh, questions you were asking, which are quite humorous, uh, it's, it's, it's a fun way to engage uh, and getting to know each other as well. Uh, I've taken notes, and next time I see you, I'm going to ask you those questions exactly. Mm. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And, so, yeah, uh, I think you're doing well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, on behalf of uh, Ilma University's Board of Governors, our Chancellor, Mr. Numan Lakhani, Vice Chancellor, Registrar, Deans, Directors, all the faculty members, uh, uh, we extend our heartfelt uh, felicitations to you. And uh, we thank you for taking out your time. And uh, I know uh, it's quite difficult, uh, especially in these days, because there are a lot of things going around uh, at international level. and. Uh, we have been speaking on that and out of those uh, challenges, you have taken your time out and you have been so kind because we have been uh, uh, in preparation and communication with you for the show. Uh, because the important thing is to uh, get the topic out for the show. Mm -hmm. See, uh, there are a lot of things to speak about and we uh, all have been uh, doing a lot of things. But taking uh, and formulating a topic out for a show and then speaking about that topic and making the world aware about this, the recent trend. So it is quite uh, uh, difficult and uh, we are really grateful to you. Yeah. And uh, I would also appreciate if you can uh, give a very short message to mm. uh, Ilma University's faculty, Ilma University students, uh, as to what they should adopt now and how should they be successful in life and what are the challenges that need to be taken care of 
so what message would you like to give to them well um uh so to if focusing on uh, on your institution um i would say that uh, uh, uh well that one one of the recipes behind a successful institution is for all the key stakeholders to talk to each other and here we're talking particularly around staff and students sometimes uh, uh there's there's little dialogue between uh, between the two uh, bodies so it is very important particularly from a, from a quality assurance perspective for the institutions to listen to the to the view of the students and being responsive for students to to that will increase the way in which students feel uh part of uh, of the university and they feel appreciated and that is also a key mechanism to enhance the quality of of uh, of that provision and, uh, and the quality of the education that future students will receive from from your institution so do talk to each other uh make sure that you 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 have measures and venues and occasions opportunities for students and, and staff to talk to each other both academic staff and and uh, and service staff support staff and um and think about uh, uh, also think about uh, uh, if we if we have to uh, consider the um, uh, the outcomes after graduations so of where students are, uh, are going to go after after having been with Ilma. Uh, do think about uh, employability, how to support uh, students in, in the new world. So do monitor what are the needs out there. Uh, do engage Ilma universities with employers, for example um uh, ever also depending on the strategy that Hilma has as uh, um engage with the key strategic stakeholders that will allow Hilma to engage in the way so if your strategy is internationalization do think about uh, uh cooperating with international universities um and, uh, and how to make the best out of that uh that's a bit on top of my head uh but uh, we were having a chat with the um, with the registrar just before you registrar before uh, before this uh, uh, this recording, and uh, we concluded a little chat with uh, if you take care of quality, everything else will take care of themselves. I guess probably that would be the <laughs> the message to conclude with. And we also wish to invite you to Pakistan. Have you ever visited Pakistan early? I, I'd love to. I've never been, never been. I had the opportunity a number of times because I've done a number of works uh, with Pakistan institutions, also with our Education Commission. Uh, but I never had the opportunity to come to visit. No, I would love to. And uh, we are also uh, planning to have uh, the next International Quality Assurance Conference in January 2023. So uh, we are expecting you to come to Pakistan, visit us, uh, visit the university see the culture, see, meet the people out here and uh, see the uh, adventures and areas and the city uh, funny uh, things uh, with us, have uh, uh, cultural food with us. So uh, we'll be inviting you for the conference and uh, we hope that you'll be here and we'll be, this time we'll be physically meeting and attending this conference. Yeah, I'll, I'll be delighted. Yeah, I hope that there will be, will be a possibility. Seriously enjoy the culture and the food and the tourist areas here in Pakistan. I'm so, I'm 100% sure that I will. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, comes with the end of the show. Uh, I hope uh, uh, the show you found uh, quite uh, interesting, and uh, there are a lot of other questions and points of discussion still pending. Uh, but due to uh, shortage of time, we need to wrap up the show. But we'll be uh, back uh, with uh, more focused areas in the show. Uh, uh, until next show, uh, take care of yourself. And uh, we'll be back with another exciting show, uh, another important guest. Until uh, then, uh, take care of yourself. Goodbye. Goodbye, Fabrizio. Thank you for the time. And we'll be goodbye. with you soon. Yeah, goodbye both. And thank you both. And thank you, Ilma. Yeah, all the best. Thank for the you. Beach.